Hello, thank you all for logging in for today's webinar. Today's webinar is Livestock Mortality Composting. I'm your host, Dr. Lynn Carpenter-Boggs. I'm a soil scientist at WSU in Pullman. Also with me is Dr. Rachel Weemey, a postdoctoral researcher also at WSU Pullman. We have uh, contributions embedded within today's talk from several uh, producers and composters, Jason Sheehan from j &K Dairy, April Thatcher from April Joy Farm, Jim Workhoven from Workhoven Dairy, and Rick Finch, who among other things manages the composting facility at the WSU Pullman campus. The material that we will go over today uh, begins with why one would compost mortalities, we will talk about what composting is in general and why it works. Get into more details about materials that can be used and how they are managed. Then more specifically into uh, uh, mortality management, mortality composting management, and using that compost once it's uh, ready to use. We will then spend a little time talking about permitting and regulatory issues and end with some additional resources and sources of support. So let's begin with why one would compost livestock mortalities. Well, if you have livestock, at some point you are likely to have some dead livestock. And that body needs to be dealt with very quickly in order to avoid odors or spread of disease. Composting is a viable option for many of these mortalities. Again, depending on where you are, you might have options for burial, rendering, and landfilling. But let's hear from a couple of our producers about why they choose to use composting. I'm Jason Sheehan, one of the owners of J&K Dairy, partners with my wife, Karen, and her parents, Tony and Brenda Vega. We milk about 3,000 cows on two facilities in Sunnyside, Washington. The reason that we chose uh, to compost on our farm was because we felt like it was probably the most natural way of taking care of animal mortalities and we could uh, take them through the full cycle of uh, using them as fertilizer on the fields and, and uh, doing what seemed to be one of the most humane ways of dealing with, with the animals. We'd started composting uh, manure in general on our dairy, I think about 15 years ago. And then it seemed like the natural progression to also compost the mortalities. You know, quick and easy way of dealing with them. You could deal with them when you needed to. We were having some issues getting the rendering services to show up in a timely fashion, particularly in the summer. So this way, if we did have a mortality, we could deal with it immediately. I'm Jim Workhoven. I, I'm a dairyman here in Stohomish County. I farm with my wife and my brother and his wife and also uh, a number of my brother's kids going into the next generation. So uh, we operate uh, two dairies here, 2,000 cows between the two of them. Uh, we've been doing it for a couple of decades and uh, I think it's a very effective, co cost-effective way of dealing with mortalities. Very hard to find dead animal services in our area. Rendering plants aren't, aren't there anymore. I would highly recommend it over burying. I mean, um, for one thing, it's a lot less work. And for another thing, and probably just as importantly, is, is that, you know, you can make use of those nutrients. And uh, um, nutrients are valuable. And, uh, and honestly, I think it actually makes a better fertilizer product in the end. Um, it really, really does help build up the soil. My name is April Thatcher and I own and operate April Joy Farm. Uh, my operation, I have um, two and a half acres of mixed vegetables. I've got fruit trees, I've got chickens, I've got donkey manure, a lot of different materials that I wanna compost. The reason we use compost is really close cycle. Um, we really want to keep that fertility cycling on our farm. I don't like having to buy inputs to add to my system. 
anything I can do to keep those nutrients cycling on my farm um, makes my operation more, more viable, but also it helps reduce my risk levels. And this, especially it's the case with animal mortality. I mean, it's, it seems foolish to have to pay to, to cart that off the farm to dispose of it somewhere when it's full of rich, awesome, amazing nutrients um, that we will, you know, could easily use in our vegetables or to, to make our soil healthier. If you're listening today, you're probably curious about using composting for livestock mortalities. So let's talk a little bit about what composting is and why it works. Composting is an aerobic decomposition of organic materials. And essentially, any organic materials can be used. But this decomposition is happening in mass or in a large volume and mass. And that changes the microbiology of what happens and it changes the resulting product. During composting, there's a transformation of the organic raw materials biologically, chemically, and physically to create this compost that looks very substantially different and is biologically and chemically substantially different from the starting materials. The main inputs that we use in composting are commonly called feedstocks. And while there are a whole range of nutrient elements in these, we talk mostly about the amounts of carbon and nitrogen as being key to um, providing a nutritious food for microorganisms to do this decomposition process. Those microorganisms also need sufficient oxygen and moisture to become very active. Once they become active, they go into an absolute feeding frenzy, degrading these feedstocks. In that process, it produces heat. Now what's special about composting is that there needs to be enough materials that there is self-insulation of, uh, of that material and of that heat. So the temperature actually builds up inside too. Because of that, the microbial community actually changes. And when we have the finished product of compost, there's not only less carbon, less volume and mass of material, in, in fact, approximately half of the material should be gone, but it's substantially more stable. The microorganisms have built up some humic acids, so the material is much darker. And because of the heat, we have very low populations of pathogens and weed seeds. So we've talked a little bit about high carbon and high nitrogen feedstocks. And let's just look at some examples of those that are commonly available on farms or maybe nearby. Um, some great materials would be wood chips, wood shavings, rejected feed or spoiled silage or haylage. Um, straw, especially material that's been used as bedding, is excellent for composting. And those red stars, the wood chips uh, and straw, uh, those indicate that those are especially good materials for forming a base of compost. Um, as we'll see throughout this, um, to encourage high heat production in compost, the aeration is very important. So it's common to build a base of materials like wood chips and straw to support um, porosity underneath the composting material. And then you should also have access to high nitrogen feedstocks. These materials are important for increasing the heat, provides a lot of nutrient value, but also can be potential sources of odor. If you have livestock, you likely have some manure. You may have separated solids from that manure, depending on your uh, processing. Um, on or nearby your farm, you may also have materials like food waste that has a lot of, of nitrogen. And 
the animal carcass itself is a source of a lot of nitrogen because of all that protein in the body. So because all farms are going to have different potential feedstocks available and they fill different roles within composting. Um, if you have had composting classes before, you may have seen high nitrogen materials referred to as the greens and high carbon materials referred to as the browns. But the high nitrogen materials include, again, the mortalities themselves. Chicken manure is very high in nitrogen. Uh, on the other end, the browns or high carbon material would be things like uh, straw and wood chips. Manures um, and hays tend to be somewhere in the middle. They may be more balanced materials in terms of their carbon and nitrogen. Um, but uh, horse manure especially tends to be uh, fairly well balanced, meaning it can compost well on its own. So depending on what feedstocks are available to you, you may, be, you may have access to well-balanced material, um, but it's very common that operations will need to blend your feedstocks. So the ideal mixture or individual material for composting is going to have about 50 to 60% total moisture, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to 30 to one, a fairly neutral pH, not very acidic, not very alkaline, and uh, again, allows sufficient airflow for aerobic activity. The picture uh, to the right here shows some blended materials. And we want to show you that um, uh, one way that these materials can be blended on the farm. Hi, I'm Rick Finch. I'm the manager of WSU Waste Management, which includes WSU Compost Facility. Um, and I've been with the WSU Compost Facility since its beginning. And, uh, 1994, I believe it was. At the WSU facility, we have a recipe of, of our compost mix, and, and we have a special mix for the, for the uh, mortality composting, and we have a pile of it sitting at all times ready so that, you know, when something comes in, we can, we can put stuff away immediately. And, uh, but we're, we're a combination of animal manure, uh, bedding, which includes kiln dried shavings, straw, um, some feed in it. Um, we're very little yard waste, but except for the woody prunings and use those as feedstocks and to make plenum uh, to help disperse the air in the carcass composting. So we, we have a high carbon uh, feedstock mix. We have different basic recipes for the winter and the summer. And in the winter, we're adding dry material. And in the summer, we may be adding straight water to maintain a certain amount of moisture because most of the process takes uh, place with single cell organisms. And they need the moisture in the material to do their thing. Once we have the materials uh, compiled and, and uh, our feedstocks built up, the compost material is going to increase in temperature. And what's shown in the picture here is just a static pile, meaning that it's not being uh, actively turned. And a static pile like this may, may require six months to a year to go through a composting cycle. That temperature should heat up within a matter of days to at most uh, two weeks. And it's critical that we get uh, to or above 131 Fahrenheit, which is 55 Celsius. This hot phase might last uh, two months to maybe even six months. And gradually that temperature will start to decline. Then we go through a longer, still warm phase called the curing phase. That will again last a, a couple of months up to a year. Now that hot temperature is really important for several reasons. This is where some human management comes in. 
the temperature should be monitored and documented that you've had at least three consecutive days um, at 131 to 170 Fahrenheit. If it's too cool, it means that you don't have effective composting. You're not going to get a good reduction in pathogens. If it's too hot, there's some risk of spontaneous combustion, meaning you could have smoke or fire. It's not very common, but you don't want it to happen. So if you reach 171, it's too hot, you'll need to add water and or open up the pile to reduce that temperature. Now, on most operations, at some point, there will be turning or mixing. When you have a livestock carcass in the material, you likely will not do this for at least four months after you put the carcass in. But at some point, to uh, help blend the material and ensure that all of it has gone through um, good decomposition, it's common to turn that material. When you do that, you're also incorporating more oxygen and bringing fresh, some fresh feedstocks to the microorganisms. You will likely see a temperature increase when you do that turning. But uh, over time, the amount of temperature increase is going to decline, showing that the microbes have used up most of their foods. And with that, Rachel is going to tell us more about specifics of materials and management for livestock mortality composting. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Uh, we are going to look now at some examples that can show and describe those steps and details that we might need to consider for bringing our materials together and carrying out this process safely and effectively. I do want to say before we jump into the examples that there are numerous ways that it can be done. The process is going to look a little bit different from operation to operation, depending on the type of livestock, the materials you have, or space available. So what we hope to do today through these examples are to provide all of the key principles that will be applied no matter which specific system is chosen. So we'll start then with one of the simplest, but also a very versatile method, and that's the static pile. It is quite straightforward, but there are a few important things to note, as we see here in this diagram, and I'll explain with pictures as well. The first thing we want to do on our impervious surface, whatever that may be, is to lay down the high carbon base material. Now this material is very important for multiple reasons. We need a high carbon and absorbent material for our base in order to collect the moisture and odors and balance the high nitrogen materials that are going to come from that carcass, and especially during the breakdown of that carcass. We also want to think about the particle size of this base as well because it provides important aeration for the pile. So on that base, we want to make sure we also make it large enough so that when we lay down our carcass in the middle, there is plenty of room around the edges because we will use that space to build up the cover material. We need to cover the carcass with at least two feet of feedstock. Um, this covering material is important to provide a biofilter for catching odors, but also providing insulation and getting those temperatures up to the levels that we need. The static pile is also easily expanded to incorporate larger operations that might have higher rates of routine mortality or when using composting in large death events such as natural disaster or disease outbreaks, simply by extending that pile in one direction to make a row. All the same concepts apply, but it's also important to note the spacing in these rows. It's good to leave space between the rows to allow for airflow, not letting one pile get too big. It's also important to allow for the maneuvering of equipment to access all portions of this row. As we've said, there's a significant breakdown during this process, and so it's good to be able to access all parts of your pile at any time that it might be needed. And as always, it's a good idea to re keep records and record the date and time 
of where each mortality is placed, since this is a long-term process. Another common method you might see for mortality composting is using these composting stalls, or bins, as we see here. They can be used for mid-sized livestock, but commonly you'll see them used for smaller livestock or for butchery waste. And these stalls allow for multiple layers of this animal tissue to be incorporated by alternating with those high carbon and balanced feedstocks for composting that animal tissue. And we'll hear more about that in a bit from one of our producers. Another factor that these built structures bring into play is the ability for a little bit more control or management of environmental factors. So as we see here, this particular composting stall located in western Washington has a roof over it to help control and manage the amount of moisture getting into these piles. Another thing you'll see, especially with a four-sided bin such as this, is the ability to add aeration to this pile to ensure that enough air is moving through during the composting process. So again, remembering that this process is something that happens from microbes and they need air with oxygen in it in order to perform their activity. Therefore, finding ways to add air moving through the pile will help speed up the process and ensure that that doesn't become a limiting factor. This can be done passively by laying perforated pipes or boxes of some sort below your pile, or actively by then adding a blower or a vacuum to that pipe to push or pull air through the pile. Again, I want to say this brings it one more time, the importance of that base layer material though. If you are going to add aeration, you need to find ways to protect that perforated pipe so that the leachate from the animal is not getting into that pipe. So you need a thick enough base that's absorbent enough but also porous enough to let that air through. We'll hear now from our producers on how they perform and manage this process on their specific operations. We were able to partner with our, con our conservation district to find funds to build the structure and it was a cost share arrangement. We chose aerated composting simply because uh, I have a small operation, I don't have a lot of labor um, at my disposal to turn and move um, compost and so having the system, you know, help, help me heat up the pile and manage the composting process without having to do a lot of physical labor to, to turn it was really appealing and that has been um, absolutely critical to our success in terms of especially livestock um, composting. So when we build our piles, we um, use wood chips, big, thick, coarse wood chips. So we'll put um, probably six inches to a foot maybe of wood chips. We cover the bottom of the bay, not all the way to the edge of the walls, but just we keep it right in the, the center. Um, the wood chips create a lot of interlocking like air space for the air to blow up through that into the pile. So we don't put those wood chips all the way to the wall because then what happens is the air blows up into the wood chips and it takes the path of least resistance which is out to the edge of the wall and straight up. So we want the air to be forced to go up right through the center of the pile. Every pile is kind of its own unique being. It's not always the same ratio of materials. It, it does vary. It's more trial and error, but it, it's, it's more you have to just use the good principles of greens and browns and um, work at making those layers um, as best you can. The addition of the carcasses actually has improved the compost because it's added a really great source of nitrogen um, and it seems to help the piles heat up. The things that I have learned is that it makes with, with using carcasses, um, it really makes the size of the mater other material that you're composting with those carcasses more important. So more um, smaller and more uniform size material really helps offset this big mass of a chicken body or a pig carcass, right? So it's much better to shred my, my dry or my brown materials and and um, add the, the carcasses in those so that they're really kind of tucked in. And 
generally it takes me uh, probably anywhere from one to three months to build a pile. I usually cap it over with some old, with some compost from an older pile or um, leaf mulch. Then it actively will compost anywhere from um, another two months to probably four months if I can keep it that long in there. Um, and then we do turn it. We do put it in the next, in another bay. There's not a lot of remains. Um, chickens, there's hardly anything left. Um, our pigs, there's definitely big bones, you know, um, is really usually what we see. And then that cooks in the second bay for, you know, it could sit there for six months, even longer if we have the time. A lot of what we try to do is we try to use a dry material, usually a kind of straw or corn stalks on the bottom, something that would have been composted but needed more manure to be composted and more moisture. So it's a perfect scenario for putting as a bottom layer. And we try to get that at least three to four feet. So there's a, a good amount of material. And if there is any breaking down and leachate with the animal, that a lot of that dry material will soak it up. And we, we lay the cow or the animal in that dry material. And then we use somewhat of a material with more moisture to it, um, usually some manure or some manure from our separator. Um, you don't want it to be so wet that it seals over and doesn't allow air to move throughout, but you've got to have some moisture to help break down the cow. So we cover it up. We have three feet underneath and try to have at least three to four feet on top. We do single layer just because it, by the time you put the bottom and the animal and the top, you're, if you're doing it right, you should be at least eight feet tall in the center. And it's hard to get it much taller than that on a mature animal. We continue to extend the row. So we've, we've got rows and we um, add to the rows. So it can take quite a while to make a row. So that's why once the temperatures drop at the beginning of the row, we just let that row sit. We basically have got to wait for the last animal to get to the point where they're ready to turn. It varies by the time of the year, but we try to leave them there for four to six months before we start doing any turning. Um, a lot of it is we're trying to let the temperatures cool down because when your temperatures are cooling off, that means the natural composting of the animals done and it needs some air turned in there. We have a company that comes in and does the compost turning. And then we try to turn every couple of weeks, depending on temperatures, you track the temperatures and when the temperatures start cooling off, you turn it again. Uh, once you turn it and the temperatures don't rise anymore, that means that the process is complete. It states in our nutrient, dairy nutrient management plan that we need to utilize the compost, compost on our own land. So we've got, uh, we use it on our crop ground that's under our nutrient management plan. So it's pretty easy. It's just kept it separate. We screen it and then we apply the compost to the fields that need it. It's also how we get rid of, uh, you know, the bedding from the calves and, and young heifers. And, uh, you know, we'd like to, we like to have that compost down too. During our normal range of operations, we actually have way more bedding material that we're trying to compost than we have mortalities. So we're really just incorporating the mortalities into something that we already are, are dealing with. You know, the animals decompose fairly quickly. You do, you do have some large bones that take a longer period of time. It goes out on fields uh, generally right before we put in a cover crop. Um, it's usually a pretty nice black um, material. So as we've heard, this process is going to vary on each operation, mainly depending on the type of livestock that you have. Uh, but there are also some other considerations we want to point out for, for different species of livestock. Um, you heard a little bit about thinking about bones. Uh, the larger livestock you have, obviously some of those are going to have very large bones and those will take more time to break down. Um, they also become much harder to break down once they are exposed. So if you go to turn your piles um, and you still have bones remaining, you can screen those out and put them back into that pile or at the end back into another active pile to try and help continue that breakdown process. Um, there are also some differences 
based on the type of fur or fiber or hair for various species. So knowing that um, if you're trying this with sheep, especially if you put in an unshorn sheep or things like llama and alpaca fiber, do take more time to break down. Another thing that might vary by species is considering the type of diseases that may be the cause of death. As mentioned earlier, the high heat in compost is effective for control against most bacterial and viral pathogens. Here's an example of for in the Midwest in 2015 with the large avian flu outbreak, there were about 50 million poultry that were culled and composted as part of the process to control that virus. So that is an option for certain diseases. So once you have your pile set up and your composting begins, the microbes take over most of the work for the next few months. However, it's not something that you can just set up and completely walk away from. There are things to check for that, so you need to be checking on your pile routinely in order to ensure some biosafety things. As I said, there will be natural breakdown. And as Lynn mentioned, the end product will be about half of the mass and volume of the materials going in. So while that process happens, there can be things that would leave parts of the carcass exposed and that needs to be remedied immediately. It can also happen as a byproduct of natural events, such as high winds or heavy rain. So for example, here we see just the day after this cow was added to the pile, we had heavy rains and ended up exposing the head of that cow. Um, that of course was fixed that day, but again, it's something you need to be able to access your piles and ensure that this doesn't happen. For one thing, any exposed part of the carcass obviously is going to increase odors which can be a nuisance issue for neighbors, but it's also a biosecurity issue as it will attract more pests. So if animals in your area discover what's in your pile, by, by usually by those odors, they can become a problem. Um, even things just as this, this little magpie can move an amazing amount of material once it figures out what's in a pile. Um, same thing for hawks and eagles, coyotes, or neighboring dogs and cats. So, Again, just ensuring that you can check on your pile and keep all parts of that um, covered up ensures that you can meet your performance standards that are necessary to do this and that this process goes smoothly, gives you an end product that's easier and safer for you to use. And so that brings us here, where we do want to think about that next step in using the resulting compost product. One of the first questions might be, how can I tell when it's done? Well, because of what composting is, there usually isn't going to be a full stop, but instead we look for signs of stability to indicate that the product has reached a stage where it is ready and could be land applied. So those signs include, as we've mentioned, the drop in temperature and the lack of reheating when the pile is turned. That decline in heat is a strong indication that the microbial activity is slowing down and slowed because the simple foods in that material have all been consumed. At this point, you'll also really have no bad odors from the product, overall low odors, and you definitely shouldn't be smelling any ammonia anymore. Um, and the material will have a rich, darker color as you reach those stable materials which are higher in humic acids. So on commercial facilities, which often have active management, including aeration and pile turning, this can be done in a few months. But for many on-farm operations, it is more likely to take at least six months and will often go on to be over a year before the product is cured and ready to use. Often one of the reasons farms use mortality composting is to end up with a high quality compost product, which brings many benefits to the soil. Some of those benefits include the plant nutrients brought by the compost, both macro and micronutrients. Often compost will give a slight neutralization of soil pH issues. And there are significant effects and improvements in soil moisture holding capacity through the overall improvement of soil tilth and structure and things like stable aggregates all are benefited from, with using compost. 
Compost also brings in more biology. It acts as a biotic inoculant, meaning it's contributing those microorganisms themselves and also providing a long-term and good source of food and habitat to support those microorganisms or existing populations of microorganisms. It is important to remember when using compost for these fertility benefits though, that it does act quite differently from inorganic fertilizers that you might be used to, which are usually supplying plant available nutrients on a scale of maybe hours to days after application, whereas compost will act on a longer scale, ranging from months to usually years for those nutrients to break down and be released in plant available forms. So as we can see from this example, even at a rate of 25% breakdown per year, which is a bit on the high side for some compost, we can see it takes up to three years for just half of the nitrogen within that compost material to be released and available to plants. Of course, the most important thing in using mortality compost is to follow your permit or exemption conditions on distribution and, te and testing. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in detail, but overall, just know that those can include regulations on whether or not you need to test the material or which tests to run and where the material can be used. So some specific examples of this are there are certain distributions that would restrict the compost being applied on ground that might grow root crops over the next three years. Um, but on the other hand, some mortality compost can be used in organic operations. Um, as always, it's important to check with your certifier on those type of things. Because there has been some concern about the use of euthanasia drugs or other types of veterinary drugs, we wanted to note that there has been research that shows the breakdown of these type of drugs seen here um, throughout the composting process, or that in, especially in the case of euthanasia drugs, these materials become highly absorbed in the compost material so that they are not bioavailable in the final product. And of course, it's a good biosafety practice to clean your equipment. So in this case, especially to clean any equipment that you use to move or apply mortality compost before using that again for other tasks, such as moving animal feed. Many of you may be asking, do I need a permit? Well, the good news is that in Washington state, many agricultural operations are exempt from solid waste handling permits for mortality composting. There are several different types of exemptions. For instance, um, mortality composting is potentially exempt from solid waste permitting if all of the feedstocks are generated on site and the final product is used on site. Similarly, many operations will be exempt if even some of the feedstock is collected from off site, but again, all of the material is used on site or on the operation where it's composted and there's less than a thousand cubic yards of material on site at any time. That 1,000 cubic yards includes feedstocks that are accumulating, material that's composting itself, and compost that has not yet been land applied. The, these types of exemptions also potentially exempt you from testing and annual reporting. There are other types of permitting exemptions. For instance, registered dairies uh, are exempt from additional permitting if composting is included already in the dairy nutrient management plan. In some cases, material that's even distributed off-site um, can still be exempt from permitting if it complies with the farm management plan. However, in these cases, you can expect to need to do um, testing of the finished compost and reporting to the uh, jurisdictional health department may be required. That testing usually includes an analysis of the nutrients in the compost, pathogens that may remain need to be a uh, very low population, pH, the overall biological stability, and, and certain metals to ensure that metals are not being over applied to agricultural land. Just as a guideline, 
the suite of testing may cost 200 to 300 dollars and the uh, many operations will only need to do that once a year but it does depend on the overall volume of compost that you're creating on the farm and some types of these permitting exemptions will also carry use restrictions and um, if it's being distributed off-site, you may be required to notify the end user of the nutrient content and the feedstocks, including that there were mortalities used in the feedstock. So again, permitting and regulations around composting do vary state to state. In Washington, there are many ag operations that are going to be exempt from additional permitting. However, you should clarify which exemption fits your operation because there may still be some requirements for testing or reporting um, or the volume that you can compost. So it's best to contact your jurisdictional health department, which is usually your county health department or the Department of Ecology to ensure you understand which exemption or permitting uh, requirements you fall under. Regardless of permitting, there are some guidelines that everyone should follow. Um, any operation has to allow inspection if, if requested, for instance, from your uh, health department, whether or not you're permitted. Using composting does not change reporting requirements to the state veterinarian. Um, there are required uh, diseases that are required to be reported and requested to be reported. Um, those still need to be reported to the state veterinarian because there are some disease agents that are not destroyed by composting and shouldn't be disposed of through composting. Everyone should maintain records of the dates that mortalities are entered. Again, the, the temperatures that are reached and for how, how long that high temperature is reached and the dates of pile turnings. And every operation is still required to meet basic performance standards. Those performance standards are these from WAC 173, 350, uh, 040, and they include designing, constructing, operating, and closing any facility in a manner that does not pose a risk to or a threat to human health or the environment. Within that, we include water pollution control, conforming to local comprehensive solid waste plans, and controlling emissions. And these performance standards are also just um, a reminder that um, things like high odor or high amounts of leachate may also indicate there are problems in the composting process. So good composting should not be rotting, fermenti fermenting, badly odorous, and certainly not smoking or on fire. Those also indicate there are problems in the process. Material that's rotting um, or badly odorous usually indicates that there's too much high nitrogen feedstock, not enough carbon, not enough airflow, and or too much moisture. Or if compost starts smoking or <laughs> worse, it usually is an indication that there's too much material together or there's too little moisture. Again, all of these things can be managed by uh, constructing the site and the pile correctly and through good monitoring. Location is an extremely important consideration uh, before you start significant composting. Things to consider would be the security and access. Who needs to have access to the site? And is that readily available when it's needed? Where are mortalities going to be coming in from? Where is compost going to be going? You want to minimize transport of those mortalities, um, both for biosecurity and just for uh, cost considerations. Meeting performance standards is also a part of selecting your location. It needs to be in an area, uh, whether that's natural and or engineered, worked into the structures that, for instance, control water runoff and leachate so that there's essentially no risk of contaminating waters. And location is also part of your odor management or odor reduction.
understand where your primary winds are coming from and going to so that nearby neighbors are not likely to con complain about odors. So public perception is going to be affected by where you locate an operation. Let's hear from some of our uh, operators about their site selection. I, site selection, you know, when you're starting out is extremely important. You have to be very conscious of, uh, of water sources that are around, um, you know, freshwater sources, groundwater sources. You know, I recommend, uh, you know, siting away from surface water. Um, our site is, is designed in such a way that it is diked to prevent any uh, water or leachate from running from the site off of the site and to prevent excess water from running onto the site from off site. So we manage the water that falls on the site, but only the water that falls on the site. Um, we're lucky because um, you know, we had the funding when we started the facilities to have a hardened site. So we're on four acres of asphalt. Also, uh, you know, you don't want to be completely up on a hilltop because, you know, that generates higher wind speeds and it does uh, create more material movement. But on the other hand, you don't want to be down in a hole where odors accumulate and then, uh, you know, pick up and move with an inversion as temperatures change, you know, and so, you know, in a space where there is some air movement, but not too much, uh, you know, is, is a little more ideal and our, our site does work for that. We've got composting sites already in general on both facilities. And so those compost sites drain, any uh, liquid would drain towards our lagoons. And so what we do is we make sure that uh, the, the compost mortalities are always closest to the lagoons and none of that leachate, if there was any, would go into our other compost. Siting the compost structure is really a crucial piece of any operation because it can make the job quick and efficient or it can make it laborious and um, more difficult. We wanted it adjacent to where <laughs> the inputs were coming. I mean, ideally that's where you want it, is right next to where whatever it is you're composting is, is being generated. Um, we also made sure that uh, any nutrients that might um, be draining from the structure. You want to be careful about where that's going and how that's affecting the water quality of the fields or land below and around it. So we, we sited it in a little higher area and then created a, a actual swale um, to collect any runoff that might occur. Um, and mine is set on a hill, so it's actually really um, great because it's notched into the side of the hill. So the, on the upper side, I can use the wheelbarrow to come straight out of the barn and dump into the back side of the piles. And the front side, um, I can, you can drive up with the tractor, open the doors and dump. So anyone undertaking livestock mortality composting hopefully has a, a general idea of how the process works now. Um, but it's a always good to have more resources and know where to go for extra support. The Jurisdictional Health Department in Washington and many states is the entity that manages permits. So they're an important resource. Uh, WSDA can be an important resource, especially for dairies and operations that have standing um, management plans that should be complied with. You may have other great contacts within WSDA. Conservation districts often have specialists uh, who can help you with the details of setting up a site. The Washington Department of Ecology uh, has solid waste management experts. And remember that the Department of Ecology is um, set up in regional offices. So contact your appropriate regional office and ask for solid waste management. There are lots of other information sources out there. Uh, WSU has an extension bulletin describing the process. Um, WSDA publication um, is, is listed. Cornell has a one-page poster that explains the basics. 
On the other end of the spectrum, there is a 35 page manual um, from, uh, from APHIS that's very thorough and especially describes considerations for uh, managing animal disease. There may even be funding support to help you prepare a site or structures. So check with your local conservation district or NRCS offices. Thank you so much for watching. Please take five minutes to complete the survey, which is linked in the description below. It will provide us with very important feedback. Thank you.